it. So, Father, we thank you for the word that you have delivered to Henry, Father. Thank you that he's taken time out with you to sit and say, what do you want, Lord? And, Father, you have answered. So, by your Holy Spirit, fill him overflowing that your word will come out exactly as you want it, Father, in spirit and truth. And we just pray that everybody here, Father, your word will penetrate our hearts, Father, as we learn more about you, what your word is saying, and that, Father, we will change because of it, Father, and it will bring us closer to you. So fall in this place, Father. Again, touch our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Pastor Andrew's been up there again. Is that you? Yeah. Yeah, no. Yeah, Debbie's been up there. <laughs> That's it. Brilliant. Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be up here. And speaking, and speaking with you all. Right, that'll work. Let me just get my notes. First of all, I just want to thank the worship team. That was that was brilliant. Um, yeah, thank you all. That was brilliant. I'm excited to bring the word today. It's not going to be a traditional Mother's Day message. Um, so I'll say this now, and I just want to echo Debbie's words. Mothers, we love you, we honour you, and we bless you, and we thank you for all that you do. And that's not just today, but every day of the year. And I'll leave it with, your, with the capable hands of your children um, to spoil you after this. The word today, in a lot of ways, is a follow-up um, from when I was last up here a few months ago. So I'll, ju- I'll just jump straight in. In the days that we are living, we hear a lot about the manner of which Christ will return. We sing about it a lot. He's going to come in the clouds in power and in great glory. He'll come as a lion of the tribe of Judah. He'll come as king to rule and to reign. He'll judge the world in righteousness and make war against his enemies. It'll be a time where every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Hallelujah. And that is all glorious and it is all true. Today, we will talk about a warning which Christ gives to his people prior to his return. When Jesus talks about the coming of his kingdom, a lot of the focus is on our walk with him. He warns us of the importance of running the race of faith, the danger of us taking our eyes off of him, and reminds us to stay focused, working out our salvation with fear and trembling. And we're getting closer to that glorious day. So his admonitions to his church are now more important than ever before. We cannot be one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. You're either his or you're not. So can we please pull up Luke 17, 32, please? That's big enough. In the middle of teaching his disciples about the coming of his kingdom on earth, Jesus says these three sobering words. Remember Lot's wife. And it's one of the shortest scriptures, verses in the scriptures even, but no less important. I don't want us to overlook these words, because when Jesus tells us to remember something, we best do so. And we have been commanded, remember Lot's wife. Jesus was speaking here in the context of his second coming. And we are closer to his return now than any other generation before us. So please, let's take these words seriously this morning. Lot's wife was a woman, was was a woman even, with many spiritual privileges in her day. For one, her husband knew the one true God, which was not common at that time. She also had Abraham, the father of the faith, a friend of God in her extended family, who would have no doubt been praying for her. 
And just like modern, just like Lot's wife, the modern day church has so many spiritual privileges. If you have a physical Bible with you, could you please lift it up? Yeah, not many around. If you need a Bible, let me know after. It's banned in 52 countries, so it'd be good to get one now. Um, do you know you have more in your hand than what all the prophets of Israel ever had? All the kings, all the priests of Israel. You have more in your hand than what the apostle Paul had. And on top of that, unlike many of the generations before us, we have complete freedom to practice our faith in this country. And to whom much is given, much is required. And yet despite these privileges, Jesus still asked in Luke 18a, I haven't given you this scripture, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? We cannot let our privileges make us complacent. And I'm convinced if we take this warning seriously to remember Lot's wife, who was unprepared in her time, Jesus will find faith on the earth when he returns. Amen? Amen. You see, there are only two people in the whole of Scripture we're told to remember. One is our Lord Jesus Christ, and the other isn't Abraham, or Moses, or David. But it is an unnamed woman who is the very symbol of rebellion in Jewish tradition. And I'm convinced that if Lot's wife was alive today, she would be sitting in a church just like us. And the first challenging question I want to bring this morning is, are you Lot's wife? Are you about to become a pillar of salt? Let's dive into the story and consider what exactly it is we are called to remember. One of the crucial elements of this account is that it didn't only end badly for Lot and his wife, but it started badly. So let's dive in. In Genesis 12, Abraham received a calling from the Lord. God called Abraham out of his home country and promised him a new land, a great nation and a blessing. In him all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Abraham obeyed, and he brought his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot with him. They, they travelled together to Canaan, and they saw the land which God had promised them. They then went down to Egypt due to a famine for a brief time, and then they returned back to the promised land. And this is where the two separated. Abraham and Lot were both, ex, were both rich. They were exceedingly rich. And their, their workers began to quarrel because there was not enough pasture land for both of their flocks. And here is where we start to see the true character of Lot. So Abraham and Lot agreed to part ways. And Abraham in his humility, having every right in the world to pick the land that he wanted, gave the choice over to Lot. Up to this point throughout the book of Genesis, we read about Abraham's calling. We read about Abraham's faith. We see Abraham speaking directly to God in prayer. We see Abraham building altars to the Lord. But we never see Lot do the same. And now we get to see Lot make a decision. So he looked up across the plain of the land. And he selfishly chose the best land, the more abundant land for himself, and left the rest to his uncle. Lot made his decision purely based on what he could see, the riches of the world. He did not care about how that would affect him or his family spiritually. Abraham, on the other hand, didn't even have to look up. He didn't have to run a cost-benefit analysis. He simply went by faith. Lot will, learn certain, will soon learn the truth that when we try to gain what the world has to offer, we often end up becoming like the world. Yeah. Can we please put up Genesis 13, 12 to 13, please?
Abraham dwelt, Abram at this point, dwelt in the land of Canaan. And Lot dwelt in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent even as far as Sodom. But the men of Sodom were exceedingly wicked and sinful against the Lord. This was Lot's choice. To dwell near a people that were actively disobedient against his God. Notice though that he didn't go straight to Sodom. He pitched his tent near Sodom. We can learn a lesson from Lot here. If you're in the presence of temptation long enough, without cutting it off, it will engulf you. We are told to flee from sin. But Lot was entertaining it here. It was in, it was in arm's reach. The real strength of temptation often does not lie in the quality of the tempting object, but in the state of the heart and the mind of the one being tempted. And Lot's heart wasn't postured correctly. He was falling into the deceitfulness of riches. His heart was focused on what he could gain from Sodom. The sin that would later be evident by his his actions was already born in in his heart right here. Somewhere along the way, Lot disobeys further. The temptation is too much. He moves from a tent outside the city to a house in the center of it. So he was no longer living temporarily near Sodom, but permanently residing in the midst of it. After some time, God comes to Abraham and reveals his plan to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah due to their wickedness due to their sin being exceedingly grave. And when he heard God's plan, Abraham Abraham had compassion for the people of those cities. While he understood God's need for righteous judgment, he pleaded with God to spare the city if he could find as few as 10 righteous people. And God agreed. He would indeed spare the city for the sake of 10 people who were calling upon his name. So the Lord proceeded to send two of his angels to Sodom to investigate whether or not the city was truly that wicked. And here is where we meet Lot again. He's sitting at the gate. This is where the important people of the city would have, would have judged and supervised. So now he was a leader in Sodom. At this point we haven't yet met Lot's wife. We don't exactly know when they married but most scholars do agree that she would have been a Canaanite and he would have met her there. You see, Lot Lot left Abraham, the blessed man of God. He's gone to dwell in Sodom chasing riches and now he decides, decides to marry a Canaanite, which would have been against Abraham's advice. Later on, he instructs his son Isaac not to marry with the Canaanite, so we can presume he told Lot the same. And this bad decision making, this disobedience plays a massive part in the way life's, in the way Lot's life plans out. Lot didn't just find himself in a sinful land about to face the judgment of God. It was through a slow process of sliding back into the world. And before he knew it, he was far from the Lord. And it's the same with us today. We don't just wake up one morning and feel separated from our creator. It's a slow process. It's a build-up of disobedience, of conformity. It's living in continual, unrepentant sin and not keeping a short account of God. And saints, we're all prone to fall into that. If we aren't actively building our relationship with Christ, if we aren't being discipled, if we aren't spending time in prayer in the Scriptures, if we aren't moving from glory to glory in Him, we are sliding back into the world. So Lot sees these angels who have the appearance of men, they're coming into the city, and straight away he recognises these are no ordinary men. And he runs to meet them, he bows his face before them, and the angels share to him their plan to spend the night in the open square of the city. But Lot knew the men of Sodom, their wickedness and what they were capable of. So he pleaded and insisted strongly that they stay the night at his house. Now here is where the story takes a drastic turn. Before they lay down to sleep, 
the men of the city, many of them, both young and old, surrounded the house, and they called out to love. Where are the men who came with you tonight? Came to you tonight. Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Bring them out to us that we may know them carnally. Here is where we get a glimpse of how exceedingly sinful Sodom was. In Ezekiel 16, we, we get the fuller picture, but this is enough to understand why God wanted to bring judgment upon these people. The men came to force themselves homosexually on these angels. They were wishing to break all principles of morality for their own sexually perverse gratification. And we see this unfolding once again in the world today. Saints, praise God that he's pulled us out of this world. The entire city was given over to immorality. So please, picture the scene. All the men surrounding the house, beating on the door, asking for Lot to hand over the, the, the two men to commit a very evil and shameful act. Lot responded first by, by asking them not to act so wickedly. It's a tough position to take because they were behaving like this long before Lot moved to their city and he still decided to go. He lost his witness. He lost his credibility. He was the salt that had no flavour. Who was he to judge them? They would have thought. He's come to us. He lives among us. He married one of ours. And now he's trying to tell us what's right and wrong. He would have been far more effective if he was set apart, if he was still dwelling in the tents outside of the city. If we are to be an effective witness, an effective witness in this wicked generation, saints, we must be very blameless. We cannot partake in the same sin with unbelievers and expect them to come to Christ. Lot now does something that I can never understand. He tries to bargain with these men. He offers up his two virgin daughters to the mob instead of the angels, thinking that that would satisfy their desire for pleasure and their thirst for iniquity. I cannot justify that, that decision. Dwelling in Sodom for so long has had a much greater effect on him than he, than he did on Sodom. And the men react by mocking him. They proceed to try and break down the door to get to the two angels. And this is where we see divine intervention. The, angel, the angels pulled Lot back into the house, closed the door and struck all the men outside with blindness. And that was the end of that. There were certainly not more than 10 righteous people in that city. And this city was to be judged in the morning. At the dawn of the next day, the angels hurried Lot and his family out of Sodom so they would not be destroyed. Can we please put Genesis 19, 17 up, Louis? So it came to pass, when they had brought them outside, that he said, Escape for your life. Do not look behind you, nor stay anywhere in the plain. Escape to the mountains, lest you be destroyed. The instruction is clear. Head to the mountain, or you will be destroyed. Lot pleaded to head to Zoar instead, which was granted to him. Now the Lord would not bring the judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah until they were safe. For he fulfills his promise, always, he always fulfills his promise to deliver the righteous out of the wicked. Now can we please skip a few verses to Genesis 19, 23 to 26. Thanks, Louise. Oh, my eyes are great. The sun had risen upon the earth when Lot entered Zoar. Then the Lord rained brimstone and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. So he overthrew those cities, all the plain, all the inhabitants of the cities, and what grew on the ground. But his wife looked back behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. 
Now those words of Jesus should ring in our ears once again. Remember Lot's wife. She looked back and she became a pillar of salt. This was more than just a glance over the shoulder, which still would have been bad. But the real picture here is that she was behind the rest of her family as they were entering to Zohar. She was dragging her feet behind them as they entered into safety. She had no urgency to get to her destination. She didn't want to leave what was behind. So the look back was a, lo was a lingering, longing glance for her old life. Sodom was the desire of her heart. She couldn't give it up. Nearly saved, but yet perished. Charles Spurgeon says this, talking about Lot's wife. If I must be damned, let it be with the mass of the ungodly, having always been one of them. But to get to the very gates of heaven and to perish there would be most awful. To get to the very gates of heaven and to perish there would be most awful. Saints, to have heard the gospel, to know the gospel, to in a measure even let it change our lives by fellowshipping with the saints and going to church, but yet not to have been separated from the world, to have not been divorced from sin, and to finally perish with the unbelievers, that is a devastating thought. But that was the reality for Lot's wife, and for many who profess the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us ask ourselves, what are we to remember concerning Lot's wife? First, we must remember her sin. She looked back at Sodom when she was expressly told not to. That look was unbelieving, it was wishful, and it was rebellious and disobedient. It was unbelieving because she had been told that the fire and brimstone would come down to destroy these cities. But she questioned, she doubted, not believing this would truly happen. She wanted to check if the word of the Lord was true, and in doing so, in hesitating, she perished. Unbelief is truly sinful. God says he is the rewarder of those who in faith diligently seek him, not those who casually seek him out in doubt and unbelief. The look was wishful because she left her family and her possessions behind. There was no gratitude in her heart for God, in, to God for preserving her life. But she was just filled with regret for all that she had lost. She wished to be back. Her treasure was more in Sodom than it was in heaven. That look back showed where her treasure was, there her heart was also. She had her affections on things below rather than the things above. Lastly, the look was disobedient. The command was plain and simple, do not look back. It was not for her to determine how serious this command was. When God tells us to do something, whatever he commands you. Do not judge whether it's a big thing or a small thing. Just listen and obey. Sin came into the world from Eve eating a, eating a forbidden fruit. We can deem that as a small sin, but it caused such destruction. Listen and obey. The second point we must remember after her sin is the judgment she faced. This was truly terrifying. She was instantly judged with the rest of Sodom, her body becoming one with the city forever. Thank God that we haven't received the same judgment in the moments that our hearts fail us. She was cut off in the very act of her sin. Not a moment was allowed for repentance. The last, last act she will do on earth before she meets her maker was one of rebellion. 
She was made into a monument which represents rebellion. A warning to every generation after her. Once you have tasted the goodness of God, do not look back to the world. So what is this saying to us? What, what is Jesus warning us of? He's speaking to his disciples. This message is to his followers. But he's giving this warning because not all of them would have been born again. You see, if you are truly born again by the Spirit of God, there are many promises that God has given us. We can have complete assurance that he is coming back for us, that we are saved, that he's given us his spirit as a guarantee, and no man will be able to snatch us out of his hand. So if all the people who are listening to this were born again, it's not really much of a warning. But Jesus has always had many followers who eventually turned their back on him, who in reality were never truly saved. <clears throat> Judas comes to mind, or the multitude who left Jesus after he gave a tough teaching in John 6. Or if you, if you need more confirmation, speak, speak to the elders here, speak to Pastor, speak to Mike, speak to Carol. I'm sure they've seen many men and women who once see, were seemingly strong in the faith, who have fallen. These are tares among the wheat, wolves among the sheep, and the bad fish, among, uh, bad fish amongst the good. Now, we're not called to go around the church and to judge, see who's safe and who's not. It's not our job. But we are called to judge ourselves, to see if Christ is truly in us. And this is what the testimony of Lot's wife should say to us. And Mike said it this morning in worship. What is my standing with God? As Paul says, examine yourselves to see if you are truly in the faith. And it's better to do that on this side of eternity than before it's too late. Saints, if judgment was to fall today, is there anything in your heart that is still connected to the world? Would you look back? Many walk with a form of godliness, but deny its power. Many walk in legalism. Many walk in a false religion that will not save them. Many love the Lord for a season, and then their hearts grow cold. Matthew 7, 13 to 14 reads, and I haven't, I haven't given you this, Louise. reads, enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. The Bible never teaches that you can be a Christian and live in continuous sin and carnality all the days of your life. The Bible teaches that the genuine Christian has been given a new nature and has a father who loves them and disciplines them. One of the principal signs of conversion is that you walk in a narrow way. Now, of course you will still have sin. Of course you will still have sin on this side of eternity. But a genuinely born-again believer will walk in the way of righteousness as a style of life. And when you step off that path of righteousness, which all of us do at the times, your Father in heaven will come for you, discipline you, and put you back on that path. If you profess to be walking a narrow way, and yet you live in the broad way with all the other people in the world, the Bible wants you to know that you should be afraid. Test your faith. Test where your hope truly lies. The Lord would not give us such a sober warning unless many need to hear it. Now I want to finish by speaking about the other person in this story, Lot. The life of Lot shows us that it's possible to, to have a saved soul, but yet live a fruitless life. As in 1 Corinthians 3.15, and Pastor does a great teaching on this. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss. But he himself will be saved, yet so as through fire. Our actions have consequences both in this life and the next. How faithful we are here 
determines a part of our reward in the kingdom to come. I want to be clear that I'm not looking with judgmental eyes at Lot, but his life is here to testify to us on the importance of why we should desire to stay in the will of God. For this story ended horribly, but it started with small acts of disobedience that suddenly got worse and worse. Unrepentant sin leads to deeper and darker sin. From the text we learn that he has children, goes on to have children with his two daughters. I won't comment, but these children became the line of the Ammonites and the Moabites, who are notorious notoriously two enemies of Israel. Yet despite all this, can we please put up 2 Peter 2, 7 to 8. And God delivered righteous Lot, who was oppressed by the filthy conduct of the wicked. For that righteous man, dwelling among them, tormented his righteous soul from day to day, by seeing and hearing their lawless deeds. Here we see Lot is named righteous. Peter says it three times. Yet knowing his life, we'd probably say the opposite. But that is how glorious our gospel is. For there is no one born in ordinary generation from the line of Adam and Eve that can claim to be righteous. If our lives were put into a couple of chapters in the Bible and you put out the best bits, we would all be the same. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And even our very best works are nothing but filthy rags to Him. We're all left guilty. And this is the glorious gospel. So God in His grace looked upon us as a, pers- as a people who have no hope. And he sent forth his son, who was not born of ordinary generation, but born of a virgin. If he was born out of ordinary generation, he would have been born into sin. But he wasn't born into sin, he was clean. And he kept himself clean, because he walked on this earth, living a perfectly sinless life. And on that cross, God made him who knew no sin, become sin for us. And God laid upon him the iniquity of us all, every sin we've ever committed. And Christ suffered for sin once and for all, the just for the unjust. Our sinfulness was imputed to him, and it was nailed to a tree. And Jesus died, was buried, on that third day he rose up again so that the righteousness of Christ can now be imputed into us, into the one who places his faith in Jesus Christ. We hand over our sin, but we must hand over our sin. And he gives us his righteousness. And that is the grace of God. That is how Lot is deemed righteous. Not because of his own deeds. But he had faith in the coming Messiah who was prophesied as early as Genesis 3. Or if you break down Genesis 1 verse 1, my pastor's done, it's it's prophesying in in those those letters. He was sealed, Lot was sealed by the Spirit of God. And God kept his promise to him despite his temporary disobedience. And Lot was saved. We all need the righteousness of God because we have none of our own. We all need the righteousness of Christ. That's what saved Lot. And he was saved, he knew God, and that is good. But because of his deep compromise, because he didn't listen to the conviction of the Spirit of God, it says in 2 Peter 7 to 8 that Sodom tormented his righteous soul. He could have left, he could have left at any time, but he decided to dwell with the wicked. He didn't leave Sodom, he didn't listen to the conviction of the Spirit. And because of that, his life didn't bear much fruit and his wife perished. Lot will answer to the Lord one day for the spiritual walk of his wife. 
Men, learn from God. Lead your family into the way of the everlasting. Lead them in the will of God. If Lot would have never gone into Sodom, his wife would not have perished. If you are a husband or a father, your focus must be on your family. It is the highest office God has given to man. Protect them at all costs. It's of the utmost importance. And younger men, if you're not, not a father or a husband yet, use this time to prepare yourself. Discern the season you are in with God and grow closer to him. So I want to conclude here. I want to say if you feel like you lack faith in Christ, if, you, if you're like Lot's wife, maybe you're relying on the faith of your husband or your wife or you, maybe, maybe your parents, maybe you're sitting on the fence and there are competing loves in your heart. Today is the day to call upon the Lord. He died that you may live. He desires that you have an intimate relationship with him. It's not just for that person next to you. It's for you. It's a must that you have a relationship with Christ. But we will all stand before him on our own faith. Or maybe you're not. And you're struggling. You're struggling in secret sin. You're struggling in compromise. But you know the Lord. Come before him. Repent. Get anything that is in the darkness and bring it into the light. And leave here free, knowing you are forgiven, and walk according to his spirit. 1 John 1 9 tells us that if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Believe that. The world is to be judged in the same way Sodom was. And there is only one name under heaven in which we can be saved. Set your eyes upon Christ. He is coming as a thief in the night for those who don't observe, obey and trust. Do not look back for the deceitfulness of riches, for the lusts of the world or for the pride of life. Ask God to search the innermost part of your heart, to reveal any part of you which still clings to the world. So we've come too far to look back. We must not grow weary, nor tired. For it's not about how we start this race, it's how we finish it. So let us pray. Lord, we come before you in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we leave it to your Spirit. We leave it to your Holy Spirit to show where we're at in truth. Lord, I pray that we leave here today knowing our calling and election is sure. Knowing that we have peace with you through the cross. Lord, I pray that we test ourselves today. And I pray, Lord, that you let us walk free in certainty. Lord, I pray that you speak to each one of us as we play this song and we worship you, Lord. Let us bow down before you if necessary, Lord. Let us repent of our sin. We thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Jesus.
и Божество на Бога. Amen. Amen.